According to U.S. media, BTS has become one of only three groups in American music history to have secured six number one hits on the Billboard Hot 100 and to have seen one of its members also top that same tally. The other two acts are the Beatles and the Supremes. So what has been the response to BTS member Jimin becoming the first South Korean solo artist to top the Hot 100? What have been the broader implications of music collaborations between K-pop stars and their global counterparts? And is the K-pop industry undergoing a slowdown or a transition period? Welcome to Asia's and Insiders. K-pop boy bands are actively taking the genre to new heights on global music charts. And for this, I have Jeff Benjamin live on the line. Jeff, it's great to see you again. Uh, great to be back. Thank you for having me. I also have Haley Yang with us. Haley, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's an honor to be here. Right, Jeff, we'll start with you. Let's begin with the broader implication of BTS member Jimin topping the Billboard Hot 100 tally this month. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's so funny because I was actually looking today at a calendar and I noticed that it was the 10 year anniversary of Psy's Gangnam Style follow up single Gentleman, which is a song a lot of people thought would be that song to first uh, be the, the first song by a K-pop artist or a K-pop soloist uh, to hit number one on the Hot 100. It didn't quite end up that way, but here we are now a decade later and BTS's Janine is here with uh, an amazing song that hit number one last week on the Hot 100. And something that I think is, is really, really special about this uh, single in particular is that the BTS members, they have been showing different sides of themselves, really artistic, new creative sides of themselves. But Chameen really showed his kind of, uh, you know, pop superstar side of himself. He was really uh, brought a song that a lot of people, I think, that appealed to a lot of people around the world. To me, it sounded like something that The Weeknd or other big pop stars might eventually uh, re release. Uh, I'm getting like distracted by uh, this great video too, but you know, he really went forward to try to appeal in a global way. His song was released in Korean and English. He put out different uh, remixes of this song. He really tried to appeal to people in a lot of different ways. And I thought it was amazing that he was able to not only be able to connect with people in that way, but it happened so much so that he was able to hit number one on the Hot 100. So it's very well deserved and a very exciting moment to be seeing him and BTS alongside the Beatles and the Supremes. Right, indeed. And staying with that, Haley, what are your thoughts on this remarkable feat by Jimin? Well, I think it's without doubt a historic feat for a historic moment for a Korean artist. And, you know, for a lot of us Koreans, it's uh, hard to, for us to separate these achievements by a Korean artist with Korea as a whole, you know. So I think it's noteworthy to have this moment in pop culture by a Korean artist. But I also think there's a productive and healthy discussion to be had. And I love how Jeff mentioned the um, Gangnam Style anniversary, because if we think about how Gangnam Style peaked at number two and Jimin's song took number one, Gangnam Style was um, without doubt a viral hit. And if we think about Jimin's song, and I might get buttered for saying it, I think we might have to change the way we think of uh, the concept of what a hit means at this point. I'm not sure if Jimin's song necessarily was a viral hit like Gangnam Style was in the sense that everyone knew about it and knew how to sing along to it. So I think it's a discussion to be had at this point. I see, right. Uh, in the meantime then, staying with BTS members, Jeff, you recently did a piece, and do correct me if I'm wrong, a piece on Sugar in light of his return as August D. What can you share with us about that particular interview? Oh, yes. Um, you know, Sugar, he uh, made his return at, as XD, uh, which is, of course, his solo moniker when he releases music outside of BTS. And it was really, really special. And I have to give a big 
thanks to him because I, I really pushed to uh, get some time uh, on the phone with him and just hear him speak uh, as an artist, as a musician, as a, as a lover of music, because I, I know in particular when he speaks, he just has a really lovely and, and kind of a really introspective way of, of speaking. So I, I hope he's not too annoyed with me for uh, forcing me to get on the phone with him and uh, hear him talk about music. But he gave me more than enough of his time, gave me extra time, actually. And it was really, really special because I think he is at this point, uh, he and the BTS guys are at this point where they're recognizing, you know, not just that it's about getting big hit singles, hitting number one every single time, but it's also about, you know, the artistic expression and their music is is really exciting. This Augusty album is going to be really, really big. He just shared some exciting features, some exciting track lists uh, on his album. And he's also trying to find um you know that that respect and that appreciation from from fellow musicians and i think this album is really going to secure that for him in a big way right hopefully Haley. also this week hype founder <laughs> hang Shiok shared some photos of Changuk with record producer andrew watt in his studio over in the u.s sparking speculation about a possible collaboration with justin bieber that being said what would be the significance of such a joint project do you think um, well, it would be a moment of a uh, former American teen heartthrob meeting a current Korean teen heartthrob. So I think it's significant <laughs> in the sense of having a pop culture moment of that sort. Well, um, well, in a business sense, it, I think it's a significant moment of collaboration, um, considering that HYBE, BTS's K-pop powerhouse, merged, uh, well, acquired Ithaca Holdings, the agency behind Justin Bieber back in April 2021. And it was noteworthy that a K-pop agency started acquiring foreign agencies uh, beyond other Korean agencies, trying to expand their, um, the, tr trying to expand the width of their market. So I think we can expect more uh, a variety and the a wider scope in terms of collaborations in the future, be it um, inside K-pop or outside of K-pop when it comes to uh, these uh, projects. I can see many fans looking forward to that. And speaking about collaboration, Jeff, do walk us briefly through BTS's relationship with American rapper and record producer Jay Cole. Oh, yes. Um, this has been another really big moment. And you can read a feature I did recently on Billboard about BTS and J. Cole's uh, love throughout the years. And, you know, once again, uh, kind of even what uh, what Sugar was getting at in our interview was kind of this recognition of, of wanting to see musicians eye to eye and wanting to be appreciated by their peers. J. Cole is a very well-respected uh, Grammy-winning uh multiple Billboard 2 album number one charts uh, rapper himself and he and BTS have had quite a relationship throughout the years in terms of just BTS being able to show their love to him throughout the years. It's funny, the actual first time we met Jungkook, uh, youngest member Jungkook, who we just spoke about, was through a SoundCloud song that they uploaded, uh, him and RM uploaded, and it was actually a cover of a J. Cole song. And just throughout the years, BTS has shown a lot of love to J. Cole, and J. Cole recently showed a lot of love back to BTS. He met Chimin and J-Hope at Lollapalooza when uh, J-Hope and J. Cole, of course, were headliners at Lollapalooza. He gave his blessing for them to use a sample of his song Song on uh, their most recent compilation album, Proof. There has been a, a lot of really exciting love. And then this single was kind of like the, the ultimate epit epitome of just, uh, you know, J. Cole's biggest fan and J-Hope uh, coming together in this way. And it was really, really beautiful, really, really special. And even in behind the scenes videos, you see uh, J. Cole calling it a blessing. So it's not just about, you know, this sort of one-way street or, you know, Korean art artists only wanting to collaborate with American artists, but there's really that kind of two-dimensional respect, and it's really beautiful to see. I love it. Right, that person-to-person -person connection. Meanwhile, beyond BTS, Haley, there, let's now talk about another K-pop mega group that is making its mark on the global music scene. I'm speaking about SM Entertainment's NCT. First then, do tell us a bit about the group NCT itself, Haley, and about its subunit NCT Dream, which is currently touring the U.S., I believe.
I'm happy to talk about them because I actually enjoy their music. Uh, so NCT is a boy band that boy band that comes from the K-pop powerhouse SM Entertainment, which you might know because of boy bands like TVXQ or girl groups, girls' generation that are already well-known names in the K-pop sphere. And NCT operates under a very complicated but unique system. So NCT consists of 23, whopping 23 members as of now. And these 23 members can form at any given time subunits that can change its member lineup in any form for any designated song depending on which members would suit that song the best are you following me kind of i am how are fans right, so responding it, it can... to that though uh, excuse me Haley, how are the fans of nct responding to that arrangement right in the beginning a lot of fans were uh couldn't quite confused by the concept and had to catch up with the changing lineup at every single release but i think it became a uh, signature mark of the group and it became a core brand identity of nct and explains why the group has been seeing such high sales numbers in recent years good to know and nct dream is one of the subunits to come from it consisting of seven of the 23 members and what's been the response, Haley, to NCT Dream's US tour? Well, NCT Dream has been seeing especially high popularity among the subunits in these days and recently launched the US North America leg of their world tour recently in New York, New Jersey last week and plans to perform in a total of 32 runs in 22 cities around the world. And, and the reaction has been very passionate over the weekend. Good to know, Jeff. I hear you had the pleasure of speaking with NCT's Mark recently. What can you tell us about that exchange? Um, yeah, I get to talk about all my interviews in this. This is so fun. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, uh, Mark and NCT Dream, they came to uh, the East Coast where I'm based. They played in New York's Prudential Center. And uh, Mark was very gracious in giving me some time before his uh, big concert, NCT Dream's first U.S. concert. And it was really, really wonderful because, you know, just like Haley was talking about, uh, NCT, it's a very busy system. Even though Mark was technically on tour with NCT Dream, he was also gearing up for a solo single that we're able to see uh, played on screen right now. And this is also another part of the NCT universe where the members release their own individual songs. And it was really, really beautiful because um, this song itself, it's 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 uh, very energetic. It's really fun. It's a little bit silly uh, because uh, it has sort of this inside fan joke that uh, gets to how Mark doesn't had a moment on television where he didn't know how to fry eggs exactly. It's kind of a long story. You can read about it in our interview on Billboard, but um, while, you know, he was definitely willing to, you know, play along with jokes with fans and, and have fun with his music, he also got serious with me backstage where he talked about how, you know, he was very honest about his schedule and how he, he was feeling quite overworked in the midst of the pandemic in 2021. Mark is not just a fan, uh, just a member rather of NCT Dream. He's a member of NCT 127, another unit in the system. He's a member of K-pop Supergroup, Super M. Uh, he had a lot going on that year, and he realized that music and solo music in particular was his way to kind of cherish and, and hold his own treasures uh, in that way. So it was really beautiful to kind of have those those fun moments where we could talk about this this fun song, but also talk about, you know, the reality of, of being burnt out and kind of the way he found himself back through music right which is why i suppose jeff in your interview you called him one of the busiest men in the k-pop industry right <laughs> I did. I, I, I told him that, and he, I, I think, is very humble in, in not really accepting that term, but I, I truly think he is. He's part of, like, three different boy bands. I mean, come on. It's tough enough being in one boy band. <laughs> that's true. That's true. By the way, Haley, you previously <laughs> talked about some, some management labels, that is, micromanaging their artists with regard to the content of their interviews with the media. Do you suppose this manner of management may be keeping fans from truly getting to know their artists as people and perhaps loving them for both their music and their quirkiness? What do you think? 
Right, and I've seen it firsthand also during interviews, as I'm sure Jeff also has, maybe. I've seen some staff members intervene, but I've also seen some staff members make their artists feel comfortable and let them, encourage them, say what they want. So I really think it also depends on the agency, but I also do think there is a default level of uh, so-called quality control going on in the K-pop scene when it comes to artists saying what they want to say during these interviews. and. I personally agree with how that can interfere with fans getting to know what the artists truly think. But I also do think that kind of quality control is also part of the charm of K-pop because maybe, who knows, what the artist really has to say might not be what the fans really want to hear or um, enjoy. So I think that kind of careful, crafted image making, more than what fans want to admit, might be part of the appeal. Right, I see some food for thought right there then. Jeff, I believe we touched upon this next question quite a while back, but for the sake of those who may have missed you on our show last time, I'm going to raise it again. Some critics have said that K-pop is facing a global slowdown, while others argue the industry itself is simply witnessing a transitional period. Based on your coverage of the industry's insiders, Jeff, what do you say? Yeah, I, I'm a little curious where what statistics people are looking at when, when they bring up those facts. Because, you know, as someone who has been watching this, not just from a U.S. perspective, but from a global perspective, there's a lot of, you know, healthy uh, and exciting growth in, in many different ways. Uh, you know, of course, if we want to compare it to, you know, BTS releasing multiple albums uh, a year, it's going to seem a little different. Or, um, or if you want to compare the streaming numbers to Latin music or Afrobeat music, there's things that uh, aren't going, that K-pop isn't holding up to in those same ways. But at the same time too, there's exciting growth in, and major growth in terms of the partnerships that are happening uh, internationally. The album sales are growing, of course, the touring and um, more uh, festival dates are, are growing in, in significant ways. And to me, those things are, are, are quite exciting. And I do also agree that you know there is a transitional period that we're in right now and i think it's going to be almost you know kind of up to whoever whoever can uh stand up to that moment to be able to say you know where is music going where is the global music industry going not just where is the k-pop industry going and how can you know these artists these agencies compete in that way so i think you know if it is a transition it's simply about being able to to meet the moment and being able to keep up with the transition so to me there's a lot of exciting growth we're seeing groups like new jeans and 50 50 able to enter charts like the billboard hot 100 not by you know fanfare and, and extreme, you know, downloads, but in st simply from having, you know, these viral hits and big streaming hits in that way. So there's a lot of exciting growth and, and I think uh, competition's only going to get better from here. <laughs> right. And staying with that, Haley, what are your personal thoughts with regard to prospects surrounding K-pop in the near future? Right. If you listen to the recent discussion that's been happening surrounding K-pop, there's been an awful lot of discussion and obsession about growth and just nonstop increase in numbers. And I think a lot of us can't find, can't help but find it quite funny considering that a lot of people around the world didn't know where Korea was on the map uh, a decade ago. <laughs> and now the discussion is just um, so focused on growth and um, number ones as if this industry has always been on the top of the world and always been glamorous and this big and maybe this is not necessarily a very business savvy approach but sometimes i just wish that a lot of the discussion would go back to maybe around the time me and a lot of people around the world probably got into k-pop for the first time and you know really focus on talking about the fun and catchy aspect of k-pop and how really what people really enjoy about it more than the numbers and the business aspect of it. I think that's a lot of the missing part of the K-pop discussion that we see today. Right. Meanwhile, moving forward, Jeff, you mentioned festivals. Now, Coachella 2023 is slated to kick off this weekend, and Blackpink is poised to headline on Saturdays. What does this latest feed for K-pop tell us about its global popularity, Jeff? 
Yeah, it's going to be a pink cella this weekend. It's so exciting. And I actually just published uh, an interview with the Blackpink members where they all gave their personal reflections about coming to uh, coming back to Coachella, rather. And to me, I think this shows just how exciting of a place uh, music is in a large way. Coachella is considered uh, the sort of kickoff festival to all festivals around the world and of course it takes place in you know beautiful california this is when a lot of people kind of you know put out their first festival performances and share the first things of what's going to be trendy throughout the year blackpink being able to headline coachella alongside an artist like bad bunny who of course a puerto rican reggaeton artist who had the biggest album no matter which way you slice it around the world last year i think it shows that music is in a really beautiful global place and having blackpink not only come to coachella as headliners but come back to coachella after first uh, appearing in 2019 which was actually their first u.s performance ever which is quite amazing when you think about it but you know that they really met that moment and they really lived up to that moment and proved that they had that sort of larger appeal that is necessary when you have a festival like Coachella with a quarter of a million people attending. So the fact that Blackpink did so well back in 2019, Rosé actually from Blackpink uh, mentioned that that was a moment that kind of helped Blackpink themselves recognize their dreams and their ambitions in a bigger way. Them coming back as headliners just goes to show that, you know, dreams and that hard work, this all can really happen in a big way. And you just have to kind of really trust yourself and, and really get back to making sure that you are, are bringing all that you can to, to what you do. And I'm so excited to kind of see how they bring a, a larger, more imagined show to Coachella in that way, because I thought 2019 was amazing and, you know, being able to them to see have a longer set, a bigger stage, it's going to be really, really exciting. So I, I think it goes to show once again that, you know, K-pop is hitting new strides and new uh, milestones in that way, too. And I can't wait to see what they bring to the stage. Jeff, will you be there at the Coachella 2023? <sighs> Oh, I wish, um, Me too, me too. I wish as well. well. <laughs> right. Hayley, meanwhile... I know, we're stuck at home. Right, I see. <laughs> Hayley, what are some of the other events to look forward to with regard to K-pop this season? Well, you know we opened this session with boy bands, but one thing to definitely look out for is the battle of the girl groups, actually. We are looking forward to a string of comebacks from some of the biggest female acts in the scene right now. So we've already seen new jeans come back and are still is still dominating the charts as we see today. I've uh, made a comeback a few days ago and basically have... Um, dominated the chart with all of the tracks from their newest album. La Seraphim and Espa are coming back next month, and we expect to see basically a battle of the female acts um, in the spring season, so look out for those, and hopefully more new records in the album sales department, because these are some of the acts that have uh, broken records back to back in the last year. And some of the other events to look out for are the fact that audition shows that were once considered quite outdated are actually back this year. I don't know if you've been following some of them, but uh, I'm looking forward to them actually. Mnet's Boys Planet has been all the rage these days. Everyone ha seems to have their pick. So Boys Planet will be announcing their uh, final lineup and the project boy band consisting of the finalists this month so look out for that and they will also be announcing another female audition show consisting of current girl groups within this month so stay tuned for that right and hopefully Haley will join us next time to talk about more about k-pop girl groups then you Je uh, jeff as well of course for now then thank you so much Haley, <laughs> yeah. for your time and your thoughts and jeff as always thank you very much for your insights thank you thank you Thank you. Right. Well, that is all the time we have for this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow. That is Thursday.